Steven Universe Save the Light is a game that incentivizes teamwork over most things. You have five star points, you have four characters, go get them. And one character typically isn't enough to get the job done. But if Steven Universe Future is anything to go by, Steven seems to think he can solve most problems on his own when he gets older. So how about I test that theory? Let's figure out if I can beat Steven Universe Save the Light while only using Steven. The rules are pretty simple. I'm only allowed to use Steven in battle. Any other character cannot do anything. If Steven dies, I have to reload my last save point. I'm not allowed to use another character to revive Steven. Also, no team attacks. While those can be activated in battle with Steven, I see it as technically needing to use another character in battle in order to do the move, and so it's banned. Outside of battle, I have to use every single character as little as possible. If I need to use them to progress though, there's not much I can really do about that. But when it comes to optional chests or secrets and the like, those are strictly forbidden. I'm also not allowing myself to assign badges or skill points to any other character, as that could potentially give Steven an unfair advantage versus if he was just alone. Any badges and skill points must go to only Steven. Now with all that said, no more delaying. Let's see if Steven from Steven Universe Future can beat Save the Light. And the tutorial immediately forces me to use Connie. Lovely. I didn't even have the option to pick Steven either, they just make me pick Connie and attack with her. So there's the first rule break not even four minutes into the playthrough. But getting past that hiccup, most battles in this challenge are pretty damn mindless. Steven's main attack costs only one star point at the expense of pretty low damage. So pretty much every battle devolves into spamming Steven's shield attack until the enemy dies. This is pretty slow, as Steven's damage isn't quite high enough to take advantage of how many times he can attack before the star meter needs to fill. Up. Once I get the ability to do perfect attacks and perfect blocks, those extra little boosts to the star meter will be incredibly useful in making this go a tiny bit faster, but otherwise we're playing the long game with Steven most of the time. Anyway, now that Greg's joined the party, I can finally explore Beach City. I could even learn how to lie. Yeah, Steven ain't getting himself out of this one. That's another rule break, and also an introduction to these crystal things, which will cost us many more rule breaks in the future. Trust me. After doing a few battles and leveling up, Steven gets the bubble ability, which will be very, very useful later on. But at the moment, I don't really need it. And now that I also have the ability to assign skill points, the main two abilities here that'll really matter are stun dash under attack and fast food under teamwork. So I focus on putting points into those two for now. In the process of leveling up the party, I also learn just how annoying these shield enemies are in a fight. If they get in the way of an attack and Steven runs into them, he'll just bounce off the enemy he's targeting and won't do any damage for some reason. And attacking them head on with just Steven takes fucking forever. The strategy then is to wait until they're approaching Steven and hit them then. Their shields go down, so now Steven can both deal normal damage and properly damage them and another enemy if they get in the way. After eventually finding the key to the city and giving it back to Mayor Dewey, I get my fourth team member in Garnet. This gives me a full five stars at the start of the battle, making this the most we're gonna immediately get for a while. Plus, Garnet's pretty good at taking hits usually, so she's a great contender for the group of meat shields that'll surround Steven the whole game. Soon enough, I'm in the first level of the Beach City Woods where I immediately run into a bit of a problem. See, I'm required to collect four light dews to make this plant grow. Problem with that is, there's only four light dews, and one of them is stuck in this crystal. This means I have to switch to another character to get it out and add another rule break to the total. Over here, I'm able to grab the attack badge, which I immediately throw onto Steven. He could really use the extra firepower to make battles take less time, but it's also a pretty basic badge I can replace if battles require a bit more than just brute force. In the second level, I'm immediately blocked off by a gate whose key is locked behind one of these guitar puzzles. Thankfully, and small spoiler alert, this is the only time I should need to use Greg for the entire game, which is great for me, but pretty sad for Greg, don't you think? Amethyst gets added to the party here, but it really doesn't matter who I add as they're just gonna be taking hits more than anything else. So I'm not really gonna bring up any new additions from here on out. But then after this battle, Steven gets stun dash. This means that if Steven targets an enemy and runs through another enemy on his way to it, that enemy will be stunned and won't be able to attack for a bit. This is useful for stopping too many things from attacking me at once, since Steven tends to get enemies aggroed on him a lot because of him being the only one attacking. Then in the next level, this happens. 
This game is perfectly programmed with no flaws whatsoever. This battle right here is a good example of how long fights can be when only using Steven. Yeah, he attacks a lot, but he still does so little damage that battles tend to drag on. But it's worth it to suffer through the pain because now I have enough skill points to get fast food, which makes the cheeseburger backpack cooldown 15% faster. Really useful for the coming boss fight. The rest of the abilities offered here don't do much to help this challenge, so from now on I'll be focusing mainly on attack until the enemy starts to hit harder. There are also light dues in this level, but thankfully they're only required for 100%, so we're good for Steven only here. Time for the boss fight. So immediately I chose the wrong name for the boss, so now we're fighting Furnace Face. Not a good start. This battle is pretty much a race against the clock. I'm aiming for getting most, if not all, of his health depleted before his minions can spawn in. I do a pretty good job of this at first, but then I get unlucky as he attacks and then opens his mouth. Once he opens his mouth, the amount of damage he takes will be reduced and Steven will get hurt as well when attacking him. Then once his minions spawn in and one of them gets a shield, it becomes impossible to attack him at all because of them getting in the way. And then the laser kills Steven, ending the first attempt. So it's clear that I only lost because I didn't name him Dave, so let's fix that. Unfortunately though, that didn't help, as this attempt goes similarly poorly. I get much closer in terms of damage, but I still don't deal enough before the shield enemies block me again. I feel like this is possible if I either save some stars to heal Steven with Encourage, or if I just manage my item usage so I can use a cookie cutter around this time. But without that, Steven gets comboed and dies again. The next attempt is where I work out my strategy. Use a star fruit right away to boost my star count to 8, then use all the stars up. If I get all perfects, that gets my star star meter decently close to full, so after a few seconds I get 5 more attacks. After that I do have to wait a while for my backpack to cool down, but we're still a ways away from the shield enemies arriving, so I'm then safe to pop a super star fruit. That ends up being a mistake though, I should have let the meter get up to full and attacked once before using it. Without badges, your star count is capped to 10, so by doing it the way I did, I'm essentially missing out on an extra attack. This does end up mattering, since after I get another refill and do another 5 attacks, it's clear that I would have won right here and now if I got that extra attack off. But thankfully, the meter gets to full before one of the shield enemies has a chance to block me, and so that's the first boss defeated. Not too hard, but the strategizing needed was actually a really nice change of pace compared to just mindlessly bashing things with a shield for over an hour. With that, it's time to go to the forge, in which Garnet is required almost immediately. I try for almost 20 minutes to just fall past this rock, potentially going through the five stages of grief about three times in the process, before then just giving up and punching it with Garnet. You win this round, big ass rock, but I will have my revenge. Anyway, a few minutes later, I get completely softlocked. Cool. The game is supposed to have a tutorial here to teach you about upgrading your weapons with Chroma. The issue is that apparently I'm required to use Chroma here and upgrade a weapon in order to progress. Otherwise, the next area doesn't properly unlock, which is something I had no idea this game did. Why is this an issue exactly? Because Chroma works the same way as crystals and that Steven can't actually break the things that give you Chroma. Now, it is actually possible to farm Chroma by beating enemies, but as far as I know, there's no way to farm purple chroma from enemies for a while, so I need to use Garnet to break this chroma over here and upgrade the shield in order to progress. To be fair, the regeneration effect the shield provides now could potentially be useful, but it sucks that I was even forced to do this, it's entirely unnecessary. Now I can go to the Great North, where most enemies are still a complete non-issue and are easy to just bum rush through with a bunch of shield attacks. Also, this is a really good cutscene, a shame Steven didn't want to be a part of it though. My first real challenge in quotation marks is this big guy right here. Since he's, you know, pretty damn huge, he takes probably close to 20 shield attacks to fully take down. And in that time, he'll eventually make his way over to Steven since he'll almost always be aggroed on him. When he attacks, he attacks twice, which somewhat negates the bubble if you put one up, but a bubble still helps. And his attacks do a lot more damage compared to what I'm used to so far. However, since I've been stockpiling a lot of healing items for not needing to heal much yet, and since Steven himself has a healing ability, and since Steven regenerates health with just one perfect hit, these are more wars of attrition than they are genuine threats. Another annoying enemy are these wizard looking things. Because of Steven's lack of reach when it comes to first striking enemies, most attempts to do that will result in you getting hit first. And getting hit first makes it so that you only start a battle with three stars instead of five. Not that big a deal, but when you're up against these things you want every star you can get. Their attacks do a decent amount of damage to not just you, but every 
everybody as long as they're able to attack. Their attack can thankfully be canceled by just bonking them with the shield, but they should definitely be your primary focus to take out first since they can be dangerous if left alone. Though after a while, I just ended up avoiding any battles with these things entirely. As for needing other characters, this stage actually didn't require me to switch from Steven at all. Even stuff like this, which looks like an optional thing to grab with Amethyst, is entirely possible to get with just two precise jumps. And any breakable rocks or guitar puzzles are completely optional. Perfect for this challenge. Eventually, I unlock Steven's second badge slot. This lets me also equip a badge that increases my health. Though I do eventually switch it out for immunity to being cold, as you'll see later. A second badge slot helps so much with having another perk to really help Steven out. Especially since none of the other party members are allowed to have badges equipped. Also, because this game is perfectly programmed with no flaws whatsoever, I heal Steven's frostbite here, but the meter still has its graphic for when someone has frostbite. Still works like the normal meter though, it just looks odd. Anyway, the entire level was pretty much a non-issue, but how do I fare against the boss? Most of this fight consists of me waiting around to be able to even attack the boss, since they're too high up to hit at first. So this first half could mainly be considered a fun cutscene with occasional opportunities to counter. When I do get to attack the boss though, unsurprisingly, I don't end up doing much damage even when giving Steven an attack boosting sweatband. And this output will be lessened even more as the fight goes on, so clearly, each attempt is going to take a while. Once Square Dot's health gets low, this is where things get dangerous and where I realize I've made a fatal mistake. This snowball attack is where the main trouble is. Now that she has low health, she throws so many snowballs at you. And if you miss even one time, it's likely that character is going to be thrown into the water, which gives them frostbite and slows down your star meter. And that wouldn't even be the worst part if I had healed the other gems throughout the fight. My logic was that I didn't need to worry about the others dying, since as long as Steven stayed alive, I could still attack and eventually win. But then once Pearl and Amethyst died, the snowball attack did so much more damage to Steven and Garnet, since the attacks weren't spread across four people anymore. This led to Garnet dying as well, then I was only able to get one set of attacks off, then the snowball attack finished Steven off despite being close to full health. So, pretty easy fix, right? Just heal the other gems when their health gets low. But then partway into my next attempt, this happens. Oh, okay. Good, well-programmed game. Oh, please don't tell me that same bit. You. Uh oh. <laughs> Why is he being put there? Did I just unintentionally get hard mode? I'm so screwed. How did I do that? Holy shit! <laughs> oh my god. Why do you still live? Yeah, I'm out. I'm out. I'm the one asking that. If I don't win this, I'm gonna be pissed. Jeez, dude! What the hell? Uh... I'm so scared now that she's gonna completely screw me over. Unreal, dude. I'm so angry that that is what the game decided to do to me. Just put me in the worst possible position. Made it so that Steven got slam dunked 15,000 times. And I lost. Thanks. So yeah, that's a genuine problem with this boss fight. That can just happen to you. And while that would be more of an inconvenience on a normal playthrough, since most people don't absolutely rely on Steven to attack and can use ranged attacks with someone like Garnet, it's practically a death sentence for me. I need that tennis attack to go perfectly in order to even do damage. And since I'd need actual ultra instinct to react fast enough to properly counter it from that position, that glitch completely fucks over any attempt it happens in. And yeah, it happens happens again on my next attempt. Great. Why is Steven there again? Are you kidding? This time, however, it puts me in a very undesirable position where I can keep the gems and Steven healed, so I'm just completely unable to counter the tennis attack, leaving me with no way to deal damage. So I struggle for a solid 13 minutes before I come to the conclusion that the fight is just impossible to win from this position. Um, I think I'm um, no, I'm 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 done. I'm out of here. Nope, I'm starting over. There's there's no way. 
There's no, if Steven ends up at the front there, there is no human reactable way to be able to do it without just being fucking lucky. There is no way. So after that whole mess and after almost an hour of just these few attempts, the glitch doesn't happen on my next attempt, so I'm able to actually execute my strategy. For the first half of the boss, I focus some of my star points towards keeping everyone's health as high as possible. This way, when the snowball attack eventually gets harder, everyone has as close to full health as possible just in case I fail to block some of them. I then use a sweat ban when it comes time for Steven to attack just to maximize my damage output as much as possible. The less I have to deal with Square Dot's attacks in the second half, the better. By the time I reach the next phase, everybody is just about at full health, so I'm able to keep everyone's health high by properly blocking against the snowball attack at every opportunity opportunity. And then the final attacks come in. Yes, it's over. Fuck you, you it fucking bitch. Huh. That wasn't even hard because of the Steven only thing. It was hard because Steven had a chance to bug completely. I guess it was kind of hard because I was kind of running on a timer, but still. I guess that goes for all bosses. That was fucking frustrating. Steven Universe Save the Light is a perfectly programmed video game with absolutely no flaws whatsoever. We've made that point pretty clear already, so let's move on. But not before opening this chest and getting the Star Starter Badge, giving Steven one extra attack at the start of every battle. Very useful for regular enemies. Okay, now let's move on. Welcome to the Strawberry Battlefield, aka Steven Only Hell. The main gimmick of this area is Peridot's metal bending powers, with these big metal blocks that Peridot needs to move in order for me to progress. There are a lot of these, and sadly, most of them are required to either find the 10 tungsten needed to finish the area, or to just progress. Uh... Yeah. Steven's fucking mocking me. How dare you. However, I decide to finagle with it a little, which leads to this somehow happening. Amethyst just kind of jumped up there on her own, and you might think that I could just use this to progress without needing Peridot. However, to me that's kind of lame, since if I'm going to switch to Amethyst, that would be just as much of a rule break as switching to Peridot to just do the puzzle. So no, I'm not going to use the weird AI as some get out of Steven only free card, unless it's absolutely necessary. So at first, my strategy to try to clear this was to use the speedy sneaks to give Steven more speed to clear the gap from the block to the ledge. But then I found out that the sneaks only give you more ground speed, not air speed. You still jump at the same speed. Which I guess that makes sense. Sneakers aren't exactly known for their air speed capabilities. So then after about 10 more minutes of messing around with this, I switch to Peridot when the game forces me to and accidentally press the X button to use her ability. Not a big deal, right? I mean, I didn't even move the box anywhere. Well, apparently the game disagrees because after I touched that box, Box, this was able to happen. Shit. How the fuck did I do it? Holy shit! I fucking did it! How? What the fuck? Okay. Fuck that metal block then. All y'all can suck it down there. What the hell? No, you're not! Fuck you! You're sure fucking not! Unfucking believable. Now, I don't know whether to count this. As far as I know, when I tried to do this before accidentally picking up the metal, this didn't seem to work. So either I'm just an idiot, or the game, being perfectly programmed and all, removes an invisible wall that stops Steven from doing what I just did when you pick that box up. But honestly, I'm banking more on the former option, since the latter doesn't really make much sense. To be fair, this game as a whole doesn't really make much sense, but I'm gonna give myself a break and just let this count as something possible with only Steven. Now. You see that enemy? Right there? Fuck it. Fuck that enemy. It seems alright at first, it doesn't do that much damage to you and it doesn't have too much health. The problem comes the moment you attack it, where it then completely disables whatever move you decided to attack it with. Steven has only one move that he can use to damage enemies. I think you can see where the issue is. I do pretty well in this battle at first, until I accidentally use a team attack six minutes in and then have to restart the game due to the rule break. Six fucking 
minutes. Battles with this thing on the field take ages. And while I can use things like a fire salt to burn it and chip its health a little while I'm waiting, it doesn't help as much as you think. This leads to me avoiding this enemy as much as humanly possible, although I still get into a few battles with it here and there. A little further along, I run into another metal block puzzle that at first looks to be a bit more impossible looking than the last one. The gist is that I need to move both of these metal blocks down to the floor with Peridot in order to climb up and then cross the gap over to the other side where there's some more tungsten. However, I'm able to at least get up to the top here by climbing up this sword and then jumping up there. The gap is the next problem where there's not only an invisible wall at the area where I'd have the easiest time making the jump, but the jump itself looks uncrossable with just Steven. However, if you look right here, there's this small little green structure here that's just the tiniest bit closer to Steven than the rest of the wall. It's also completely solid. So, after a couple more tries... Oh, fuck yes! Fuck yes, dude, let's go! Unfortunately, immediately after, I have to use Garnet to actually break the tungsten out of the crystal here. But the fact that I'm even able to completely bypass the block puzzle and only use Steven is an accomplishment itself, honestly. So, that should do it. I can just wait up here and Garnet will automatically jump up here for me to use her, right? Right? What are they doing? Get over here. What are these dipshits doing? Get the fuck over here. I'm so pissed. Are they not able to come over here because they don't have a path? What are you doing? Where are you going? This is so dumb. That sucks, dude. That sucks. Well, actually, no, because as it turns out, the AI won't follow you up here at all. You have to switch to Garnet, and you have to get her up there yourself. And if that wasn't bad enough, Garnet doesn't have a double jump, so she can't actually make this gap or make it up the cliff without using Peridot to move the blocks around. This is really demoralizing. Because if Garnet just jumped up to me like the AI would usually have her do, this level is actually entirely possible without using Peridot at all, which is really, really cool to me. But alas, I have to use Peridot so that I can then use Garnet to get up there and get the tungsten. That blows. But other than that pretty big road bump, the rest of the level is possible using only Steven. The next level, however, is where these mostly good fortunes end. This ledge here has a chest on it that contains the orange key necessary to grab this piece of tungsten from behind the gate. You're meant to grab this metal box and slot it into the hole in the ground, and as you can see, there's just about nothing else to work with aside from this comically small rock. I also messed around a bit with potentially skipping the gate entirely with only Steven, but that alcove is pretty reinforced with invisible walls, so most attempts to just jump inside go pretty damn poorly. So I'm pretty sure that unless the mother load of all glitches is discovered that lets Steven get infinite height or something similar, I think it's safe to say that this is completely and utterly impossible with only Steven. Thus, I use Peridot to put the metal blocks in place, then use Steven to grab the key, unlock the gate, and then if all that wasn't bad enough, I need Garnet to even break the tungsten free in the first place. Great. And the funny part is, even if I were able to get that tungsten with just Steven, this nightmare section immediately follows it. As you can see, these are clearly very sharp spikes that Steven wants absolutely no parts of, as I'm pretty sure sharp objects are fairly detrimental to one's health. As such, you're once again meant to use Peridot to move a couple metal blocks to bridge the gap across to the other side. At first, I saw that Steven was actually able to stand on the hilt of this axe if I jumped on it just right, so I initially tried to platform across the weapons over to the other side. But this proved to be pretty fruitless, as not only is this sword just really, really hard to jump to in general, and not only does landing on the blade just make Steven slowly slide down to his painful, painful death, but landing on the hilt of the sword would just result in Steven being unable to jump properly and then sliding off anyway. Now, I admit, it's very very possible that I just suck at video games and that you're able to make that jump and stay on the sword perfectly fine. However, after I eventually gave up and just used Peridot, I used the metal block to make my way over to the sword and see how possible the next jump is. Yeah, I'd love to know how this fat ass is gonna be able to pull that one off. So yeah, another point for teamwork. Yay. Well, that last level was a train wreck, but surely the third level is possibly to do with only son of a bitch. All right, well, that just needed Garnet to break a crystal. No big deal. And hey, there's even a nice and easy piece of tungsten right out in the open here. Surely that's a sign of good things to come.
Nah, I'm just messing with you. This is completely optional, which I only find out after switching to Peridot just to come up here. Whoops, guess that means the run's ruined. Time to restart it from the beginning. So aside from one of the tungsten pieces needing Garnet to get to, the rest of the level is possible with just Steven. And I'm also happy to report that this boss, which upsettingly isn't able to be named something like Tom, was pretty easy for the most part. Tom's main gimmick is that he has a weak point that's randomly set to one of three places. His head, his chest, or his hand. But while hitting the weak point would be nice in order to deal more damage, you don't actually need to hit it to be able to do damage. Which is a blessing, considering that after my first round of hitting his weak point a few times, it then moves to his head, making it impossible to hit with Steven. This comes with one key side effect, however. Tom only really does a proper attack if you hit his weak point enough. With Steven being completely unable to, this pretty much means that Tom won't do an attack for the rest of the fight, but that's not necessarily a good thing. With Tom being aggroed on Steven, he will at least move closer to him, and while he isn't attacking, Tom will instead choose to blindly swing his mace around over and over again, which Steven can't block, and which will continue to do damage to Steven for the rest of the fight. But thankfully, this isn't very hard to play around. The mace doesn't actually do that much damage to Steven, and while you would be missing out on some hits, Steven could put up quite a few bubbles to completely avoid damage for a good period of time. This won't prevent damage entirely, but even then I have plenty of big donuts stocked up to heal Steven should he ever get low. So with this strategy of bubbling, healing when Steven's low on health, and doing damage when I can, this boss is probably the easiest one so far, and I beat it on my first try. That's certainly a nice change of pace, especially considering how ruthless the strawberry battlefields were in needing to use other characters. Just the pick-me-up I needed. After this level up, boosting attack starts to become more expensive, which means I need to start waiting for two level ups before I can put more into attack. Because of this, and because I know that Steven will start to get four points every level up after a while, I decide to finally start investing in some more defense, since the enemies are bound to get more dangerous from this point on. It's better to be ready now rather than needing to grind for more defense later. Other than that though, nothing of any real note happens in the Sky Arena, so let's move on to what will be the most rule-breaky part of the run. After we enter the temple, lovingly named the Spooky Basement, and encounter Hesonite, she proceeds to style on all the crystal gems, then does this weird white screen thing to Steven, and then suddenly everyone is separated. We're only allowed to play as Connie and Peridot in this section, then Pearl, Greg, and Amethyst in the next section. No Steven in sight. There's not really anything I can do about this. Speedrunners have found a way to walk while you're in cutscenes, which lets them skip stuff like the day fight, and I tried to do that here, but this cutscene in particular seems to be immune to it. Thus, unfortunately, I'm going to have to play through pretty much this entire area without Steven. At this point, you have to wonder if this video is even a Steven-only video anymore. That being said, there's actually not too much to talk about here. I do get into a few admittedly entirely avoidable battles along the way, and instead of putting even more pain on myself, I just decide to fight them out instead of, like, restarting the game or something. Granted, these are already kind of stressful since no other character has any skill points allocated Allocated. And for Pearl's group specifically, they don't have access to the backpack, so there's no form of easy healing or star points. So I suppose that's punishment enough. Also, a number of you might disagree with this, but while I was here, I did decide to grab a bunch of the optional stuff here as long as it didn't require me to go out of my way to use a character's power too much. Except for this one. I figured I'm using Paradox powers anyway, and it's literally right there, so why not? Might as well take advantage of not having the Steven restriction while I can. After all that and making it through both sections, I finally finally get control of Steven again, which means we're back to being Steven only as much as possible. Then after we get of Light Prism Jail and barely 40 fucking seconds after waking up, we get another goddamn metal block. Are you fucking with me? Thankfully, there actually seems to be a way to skip this entirely, and those of you who watched my stream of this game a little less than a year ago might see where I'm going with this. Back where Steven woke up, if you jump up here and then jump towards the stairs, you can very carefully make a few jumps off of this cliff, which lets Steven make it up here. It's pretty precise, and sometimes the jump just won't work, but it's very possible, and past this door is a loading zone back to the section with Pearl's group. Now it's just an easy trek back to the start, where a warp pad is waiting to get me the hell out of here. But it's not that easy. The next story trigger won't activate unless you actually beat the boss like you're supposed to. But that should be fairly simple. Just warp back to the descent, fall back down, and then walking over here should trigger the cutscene. But it doesn't for some reason. 
that's fine. I should just be able to use the exit to the right, then come back in and the cutscene should be able to trigger, right? What? Oh. That's a new one. Why are we doing this again? <laughs> this game is weird. <laughs> okay, so new plan. Just did the jump again and went back to the warp pad. This time I'm gonna warp somewhere outside of the basement entirely, then come back in and try again. Why? What? Why am I here again? What? Hello? Okay. Here's what I think is going on. This level, called The Depths, is coded so that on the player's first visit, this sequence with Steven is supposed to play. This makes sense, as when Pearl's group walks into this loading zone, you're technically supposed to be playing this level for the first time. However, to stop this sequence from happening every time you enter this level, there's a flag set somewhere that turns this sequence off so that if you, for example, come back to grab something you missed, you don't have to do this whole song and dance routine every single time. The problem for what I'm trying to do is that I haven't triggered this flag yet, as it seemingly only gets triggered when the entire group is reunited. So what's essentially happening is that by exiting this level early, I haven't set the flag, so the game still thinks I haven't actually played this level yet. And so every time I re-enter it, no matter where I enter it from, this sequence is going to play, and I'm going to be plopped right back into this spot. This is a problem, because I'm fairly certain the only way this boss cutscene can trigger is if you enter this area from this specific loading zone. But this loading zone takes takes you to the depths, which still thinks you're playing it for the first time, and so places you back at the start instead of next to the loading zone you need to use. So that makes this skip impossible. Without using Peridot and getting past the door, I can't reunite everyone to trigger the flag to stop that from happening again. What a load of bullshit. This is perhaps the most complicated roundabout way I've had a game tell me to go fuck myself in quite a while. But whatever, I tried my best, let's just move on. After reuniting everyone, we come to yet another metal block, but this one's easy to skip. Jumping around it will get you right over to the other side. But then we come to this hot mess, where you're intended to take this metal block with you throughout the level to bridge your way across the many gaps and make it to the doorway at the other side. Steven doesn't even come close to clearing this first gap with his double jump, so you'd think this is a lost cause and I'd have to use Peridot, right? Well, not exactly, because remember, this game is perfectly programmed. There's a warp pad right at the beginning of this section that you can just use without any restrictions. And the loading zone at the other end of this big room just so happens to connect to the door close to where the boss is. So, because I could just warp to anywhere from here, all I have to do is warp back to the descent, fall back down, and use the exit to the right. Since the flag has now been set, I will be correctly warped to the other side of the big room, and then by entering the descent again from the loading zone, the boss will properly trigger. And you want to know the best, most satisfying part of all this? This boss is a complete and utter joke. Because of the decent sized stockpile I have of both star fruits and super star fruits, I'm able to just keep attacking and attacking and attacking. Each attack does pretty decent damage too, so the damage just keeps piling up. In fact, it's so much damage that the Light Warrior is only able to get one attack off, which is very easily countered with a bubble on Steven since it gives you so much time to prepare for it. After that, there's nothing it can really do as I deplete the rest of its health. Wow, that was easy. <laughs> You're kidding. That was the easiest fucking thing in the world, dude! after the bullshit I had to go through. Now that was a stress reliever. With that, I have one more proper area to go through before it's final boss time. Let's take on the forge. So after I finished the basement, I stopped recording and then came back the next day to continue. So I warped to the level I just got to, and this happened. Time for big man's big forge. This is it, getting there. This should hopefully be... Uh-huh. So why was I warped here? Interesting. Part of me wants to go back, but I guess who cares? <laughs> what happened? So, uh, I guess this level's possible with only Steven? My guess is that since I didn't actually activate a warp pad in this level yet, the default position it warps you to instead is set right near the end of the level. Which is odd, because every single other level I know of just puts you at the entrance if there's no warp pad at the start. I know you're probably getting sick of the joke, but I'm telling you, this game is perfectly programmed. And to really accentuate that, I also found this. Are you 
kidding. You fucking kidding? A uh, good thing I just hit the warp pad. Yeah. And I can't switch to another character to get him out either. So, uh, yeah. Good thing I activated that warp pad, huh? Not enough proof for you? How about one more? I'm never gonna use it. Let's go. Why? 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 <laughs> we used the backpack. I can't even use the backpack. You're 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 joking. I, I'm switching. Okay. I can't even switch characters. <laughs> what the hell? Please, Steven, uncurl. Oh. I never actually did this. Leveling up is just the best. That doesn't help my situation much. Oh, you know, why? Why did he uncurl there? That would have been cool infinite height if I could have accomplished that and got out of it. Ugh. Okay, okay, enough of my complaining. What is this level actually like? Well, at the start, the enemies weren't really that bad. Their attacks weren't hurting the team too much, and even then I could usually kill them before they get a chance to do any real damage. But some of them could be really terrifying. Like these giant dickheads who can fire off five of these cannonballs that do a shit ton of damage if they hit you. Granted, I can put Steven in a bubble and avoid some damage, but if more than one of them hits Steven, it's likely he would go down in two or three hits. Thankfully, the cannonballs can also hit the enemies themselves, and I'm able to take down the two big guys before they can give me any trouble. So the enemies range from pretty easy to pretty terrifying, but overall it wasn't very difficult to get through. And then there's the final proper level in the game, Hall to the Heart. This level consists of a gauntlet of several enemy encounters leading to the end. I could just skip over this since it doesn't exactly sound that interesting, but you know what? For the sake of great YouTube content, I'm talking about all of my fights with these guys. Thankfully, right off the bat, I get one of the best badges in the game, the Star Cap Badge, increasing my Star Cap from 10 to 12. Trust me, this will make a difference, even if it's a small one. As for the first fight of the level, it's kind of a joke. Once you take one out, the other will start to attack more often, which could be a problem, but it's not often enough to be a real issue. Chipping away at them with Steven is too much for them to handle, and they're taken care of pretty easily. This fight is pretty easy too, as it really serves as an introduction to this guy. Oh, there's a burning super death sword! He can take quite a bit of punishment, so the strategy for me is to take care of the two wizards first. They can do stuff like heal their team, attack the party with a constant pulse of some kind, buff their team's attack, and more, so it's best to take care of them first. Once that's taken care of, I can properly do enough damage to the big guy well before he has a chance to approach me. However, this was only possible because I was able to take care of the wizard so easily. He could be a very big problem in a fight with stronger enemies, but more on that later. This fight is where the problems begin, and you might think that's because of these two, right? Nope, those two are actually pretty easy to take care of. It's because this shield motherfucker got one hell of an upgrade that's specifically engineered to counter my usual strategy against them. Usually I like to save them until last because then they attack more often, which makes them put their shield down and lets me pummel them to death. But with this guy, that's not happening. Look at how little damage I do to them with 10 whole star points. Now look at how much damage he does when he attacks. Now look at how often he attacks. Do you see the problem? This is pretty much a balancing act to do as much damage as possible while keeping Steven healed up so that he doesn't get fucking nuked if he can't use items or do any actions for a bit. Luckily, I do have my other meat shield, I mean party members that the enemy can target instead, which gives me a little breathing room. But because only Steven is attacking, it's likely it'll stay aggroed on him a good portion of the time. I'm able to persevere, but I really wasn't expecting that to be as nerve wracking as it was. And then I get sucker punched. What guys? <laughs> This fight is pretty much the way from earlier, but one extra enemy is all it takes to turn it from kinda stressful into an endurance test. Granted, my strategy for this fight kinda sucked. After killing the wizards, I decide to kill the other smaller one first, figuring that I'd have enough time to kill the big guy like last time. But the time it takes to kill the smaller guy is just the right amount of time for the big guy to actually reach Steven. And how much damage does he do? Yeah, and that was with a bubble stopping the first hit. 
Holy shit. And now the big guy is close enough to where he can do this attack relatively quickly. So I pretty much have to play defensively if I want Steven to even stay alive. Thankfully, he does eventually switch to attacking another character, giving me time to finish him off. But wow, that was stressful. Thank God that's the last regular enemy in the game. And now it's just about final boss time. I grab this light Steven here to give me what will hopefully be the last level up I need. I pump every skill point I have into defense, and now these are everyone's final stats. Nobody but Steven has used any skill points, Steven's the only person in the party with badges equipped, and the badges that Steven does have equipped are both star point related. Now, I probably should have switched out the extra star point badge for something that raises attack or defense, but I wanted to try the fight out with this first and then go from there. So with that, let's end this. This thing's a joke. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm disappointed too. But the way this boss works does nothing but put Steven at a pretty big advantage. You see, most bosses work on a sort of timer, where after some time passes, that's when it'll attack the party. But the thing is, once the prism's health reaches a certain threshold, and if you pick the right dialogue option, it'll switch its eye color, which completely resets that timer. Combine that with the fact that the only thing it's able to do is heal itself for a fraction of what I'm dealing to it, and you have a recipe for a boss that I took no damage from. Crazy. And then there was Hessenite. This boss is something that I don't think I can properly describe with a script or anything post recording, really. So I think I'll let the audio from my first attempt speak for itself here. Oh god. Look at how little her health goes down. Oh god. All right, we're going to be in this for the long haul. Uh oh. Could've, could've went worse. I'm literally doing one fucking damage to her sometimes. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, am I even gonna be able to survive? Uh, holy fuck, dude. Literally one to two damage per turn. Yeah, I don't think that one attack point's gonna make much of a difference. I might end up putting it back on if I fail though, just because this is holy shit, dude. <laughs> That's fine. Problem with this though is that if that gets too far, uh, I'll wait until she comes back. If that gets too far, okay. Oh my god, it's not much better. That's a little better, but not much. Ow. This is intensely upsetting. <laughs> I'm gonna be here for like a half hour, dude! God, I'm probably just getting to three-fourths of the way there. Death by a thousand cuts, this is. Except in this case, it's death by a thousand shield bonks to the knee. Dude, it's she's not even flinching. And I have to stay alive as well. Which, that shouldn't be that hard, let's be real. Ah! Well, they're dead. <laughs> That's bad. That's very, very bad. Oh wait, maybe I can remedy this. Maybe this item I choose you. Maybe we're gonna do this. Steven's the one that desperately needs to stay alive. We're halfway there! Fucking crazy. I think we've been at this like 15 minutes. That gets rid of the bubble? Well, that's just not fucking fair. Or maybe the bubble, like, reduced how much it does. That'd be fine. That's perfect. In fact, that lets me set up a little bit here. Fuck, ah, come on. Dare 
This should be it. longest boss of my life now don't fuck this up <laughs> you thought i was gonna need another attempt didn't you to be fair i would have been very pissed if i did because that fight took me almost 23 minutes and it felt even longer now there might have been a way to make that fight easier mainly that i can get a second shield schematic just fine with only steven and by upgrading the shield it essentially gives steven a way stronger attack that does a fuck ton more damage but that would require a lot of chroma grinding from random enemies since Steven can't break the things that give you chroma. That could potentially take hours, and that was just not something I was willing to try immediately. So I just rolled with what I had, and it ended up working out. So, is it possible to beat Steven Universe Save the Light with only Steven? Uh... No. But is it possible if we ignore every instance of needing another character to progress? Technically, yes. Is it very fun? Not really. But hey, it at least made for interesting content. I hope. So, what lesson did we learn today? It's that Steven and Steven Universe Future sucks dick! <laughs>